Brothers and sisters, I am extremely happy uh, to be able to serve you tonight. Although uh, some things were unexpected, as me uh, being able to speak tonight, I am glad that I'm able to do it. Um, although still far away, after months uh, months of being apart, I'm glad that you're still here. You still want to uh, enjoy God's word. Uh, although being apart from your brothers and sisters, you still take your time to listen to what God has to say. Uh, I long for those days in which we're able to meet again. Um, I long for those days in which we can share stories, experiences from uh, um, our past week. But I know and I trust God that through these tribulations, through this um, um maybe hard times we're living, I know that one day we will see uh, our united kingdom. We will see each other being united. And I've seen that over, although over this past year, uh, there's struggles and battles, a lot more battles maybe to face. And in a way, in times we were lonely, I felt God's presence stronger than ever. And I've seen that whenever I was at my lowest, and maybe whenever you were at your lowest, you've seen God's hand and great hand that kept you on the mountain. Although uh, you went maybe through uh, valleys, valleys of death, and you've seen bodies, the left and right people, fallen to this world, you've seen that although people were falling, you see that God's mighty hand was keeping you on His throne. And we're thankful for that. And I know he, there's just so many reasons for us to bless him. There's so many reasons to thank him for that we're still here, still longing for his word. So although there could be maybe hundreds, tens of you, I don't know how many are going to watch this program. And I cannot pretend that I know everything you're facing. I can't pretend that I know all your struggles and all your troubles, all the exams that come to your life. I cannot pretend I know them all. But I know that we have a powerful God. I know that in your battles, in your struggles, He will show you great strength. He will give you strength. He will hold you in His right arm. And in many situations, I know that if He didn't hold me, I would have been down a long time. And although I wasn't expecting, I didn't know I was going to say something tonight or today, whenever you're watching this message, I know that um, I want to give you a message of encouragement. I want to share with you a message which God shares with me every time I open His book. Every time I feel down, every time I feel like I can't go any further, I read a couple of verses. A, verse, so a couple of verses that I want to share with you. And those verses are from Psalm 91, verses 1 and 2. And I know that, as I said, I don't know everything you're struggling with, but I know that He does. And I know that He knows every little inch of the problem you're facing. Every little inch of a struggle, every little inch of your exam, which in a way you feel like you're failing over and over again. And I want to tell you that He tells you exactly these words. He tells me and He wants to share it with you too. And Psalm 91 verses 1 and 2 says as follows, Whoever dwells in the, shel in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God is in whom I trust. In a way, in these situations, we have to live by faith. As I said, in these situations, you don't see maybe the light at the end of the, the tunnel. And that's where faith comes in. That's where we show we trust God, although we cannot see our exam being or passing our exam. That's what Christianity is, is having faith. When everything is down, when everything is dark, that's what it means to be a Christian. That mean, it means to follow God blindly. And in a way, you will see through faith that there is going to be a rescue for you. That there is going to be a rescue for you. And this 
Psalm comes, uh, in a way, finishes even greater than it starts. Because with God, there's always greater endings than beginnings. In a way, um, the devil always shows, shows us the beginning, but he never shows us the end. God shows us the beginning and the end. He, he, shows, he shows you that you're in a, in a situation, you're in a problem. He shows you that he's with you when you trust in him. He's with, he's with you throughout the situation and he will bring you at the end of the tunnel. He will show you that light. And this psalm be, uh, finishes in a way with us. With us allowing or uh, showing love towards God. And He showing bad back. But not because we showed it first, because He was the one who showed it first. And uh, verse 14, 15 and 16 say as follows because he loves me says the lord i will rescue him i will protect him for he acknowledges my name imagine that god says that he loves you just because you know his name that you are a child of him he will call on me and i will answer him what do you want more than that promise? Whenever you open your mouth towards God, He will answer you. Even though it might not be the answer you're looking for, He has the right answer for you. I will be, I will be with Him in trouble. An another promise. I will deliver Him and honor Him. So you will not be shamed in front of people or the devil because He is the one who will show you honor with long life and I will satisfy him and show him my salvation. Five verses, 12 promises. God has so many promises for you. So many promises that he's ready to fulfill if you choose to stay under his arm. If you choose to stay under his shelter. What that means is living under present under, under his presence all these promises will be will be fulfilled if you decide to live in the or under the presence or under his wing under the presence of god he will protect you he will be with you in all your troubles he will show you salvation he will deliver you from any struggle if you decide to stay under his wing I want us to praise Him for that He is a faithful God. And although we haven't been faithful in so many of our promises, He remained faithful because that is just His nature. And that nature He is trying to install in us for us to be faithful. In these hard times, He wants you to be faithful. He wants to share with you a part of Him, a part of His nature, its faithfulness. And you know what? It's easy. Trust in Him because every time He promised you something, He was faithful. But now it's your time. It's your time to trust Him. It's your time to praise Him in your struggles. It's your time to praise Him in your troubles. It's all time. It's your time to praise Him in your exam. Maybe you want to, Maybe it might be the biggest exam in your life. It is the moment when you say, it's in this year, I want to stay under His wing, if you choose so. So together, brothers and sisters, let's praise Him because He deserves it. He deserves it. He is faithful and He has been with us throughout this year and He will be with us throughout eternity if we decide to stay under His wing. So brothers and sisters, let's praise Him because He deserves all the praise because He is glorious and He is amazing. Let's start praise with let's start praising the Lord with me, brothers and sisters.
that stone was moved for good For the Lamb had conquered death And the dead was from their tombs And the angels stood in the wall And the souls of all who come to the
That is right. He is the God that makes a way where there is no way. And I really want to emphasize the fact that we want to honor God. And I've said this many times over the previous times that I was here, because we want to give our best to God. And when we give our best to God, that's when we see the best of God as well. So I want to thank the worship team for their service and their passion for, you know, leading us into worship. And I, I know I, I've said that before many times, but it never gets old and it never stops becoming true. So I really am, you know, appreciative of each and every one of them and their sacrifice to be able to be here and to, to lead us into worship every single time. And of course, I want to dive into this week's message, which is part of this uh, series that we have called Honoring God. And I just want to say that I'm really excited to be able to speak about the one that the part that I have, which is very relatable and very uh, meaningful to me as a person. And that is the fact that we honor God when we prioritize Him. We honor God when we prioritize Him. And that means honoring God with your priority. I want to open up to Matthew 6. This is going to be the text that I'll be focusing on. And this is, of course, part of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And in here, we see a number of different things that Jesus talks about, which should be on our priority. And if we do that, we're able to honor Him. There's also quotes that I, I really want to share with you guys, because um, when we say honoring God, I really want to simplify that for you. When we put God first... All other things fall into their proper place, is a quote from Ezra Benson. Another by Tozer, you probably have heard of him. If God gives you a few more years, remember it is not yours. Your time must honor God. Your home must honor God. Your activity must honor God. And everything you do must honor God. You see, I could talk about a lot of things when it comes to honoring God with your priority. There's so many areas that you could go into. There's so many um, ways to explore this. And I really want to put a disclaimer that I won't be able to go through everything, but I'll be able to go through what God has put on my heart to share with you all. So I really want to emphasize that every time in the sense that, you know, we could talk here for hours and hours about this, but I really want to just focus on the key things that God has centered on my heart. So, like I said, it is important to honor God with your priority. Now, how do we do that? What is the key points that we need to focus on? First of all, we honor God when we prioritize living a righteous life in secret. And I'll just go through some of the verses. I won't read everything because it is quite long. But I will go through the verses that I'm kind of referring to, which is, first of all, for example, number one, the first verse. Take care. Don't do your good deeds publicly to be admired because then you will lose the reward from your Father in heaven. And then just at the end of that, verse four, it says, give your gifts in secret and your Father who knows all secrets will reward you. Now keep an eye on that, that phrase where it says, give your gifts in secret, as in in secret, and God who knows all secrets will reward you. Then we talk about prayer, and it says, don't pray like the hypocrites of the Pharisees that pray publicly on the street corners or in the synagogues where everyone can see them. This is the reward that they will all ever get. And so Jesus is saying, pray 
away by yourself, shut the door behind you and pray in secret. Then your father who knows all secrets will reward you. And then it continues and it, and it gives that uh, the prayer of our father, right? And we see a few things that we see here, right? Even the first part that Jesus says, our father in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Now that's the King James version, but in, in this version, New Living Translation, it would say, may your name be honored. So hallowed would be to, uh, to be holy or sanctified or to be honored. And so the idea that I'm trying to get to is that here we have Jesus giving an example, right? Of doing these things in secret, even when it comes to fasting, right? Don't make it obvious as the hypocrites do. And so it says at the end again, verse 18, then no one will suspect your fasting except your father who knows what you do in secret and your father who knows all secrets will reward you. So, like I said, the first point that I want to make is that we honor God when we prioritize living a righteous life in secret. Now, obviously, what you do in secret will appear for everyone to see naturally. It, it happens just because whatever is inside of you will always come out, right? We see our true colors every time. So that's why the focus should always be in secret. But as a result or a consequence of you doing that, people will see naturally the fact that you do these things in secret. And that's not because you're trying to do that. You're not trying to show off. You're not trying to make it obvious. It's just how things are. So this is what I'm trying to point out, right? Is that we should have this connection that is deep with God in secret. And when we have this relationship that is authentic, that is just between us and Him, and is in secret, we start to see how God rewards you. And obviously we're talking also spiritually in heaven and these are things that we will have for eternity as a result. So keep that in mind. But one very important thing I also want to remind you is that these actions, prayer, fasting, um, giving or doing good deeds to people in need, these require something, something that we all have. And no one, of, no one has more of it or less of it we all have the same amount. And obviously what I'm referring to is time. None of us have more than 24 hours in a day. And if you haven't guessed it, if you want to live an honorable life, you have to give up time. You have to know how to spend your time correctly. So prayer obviously doesn't happen by itself, right? You don't just magically be become you know, a person who loves to pray, you know, in one day or overnight. You have to do it on a daily basis, consistently. And then as a result, you're able to see the, res uh, you're able to see the benefits of having a deep connection with God through prayer, right? So Jesus showed us this exact example when we look through the gospel for example, right, in Luke 5, I'm not going to read the verses, but it says, um, actually, I will read the verses because I have them written here, but I, I, I will just kind of go through it uh, one by one. But the idea is that it says here in verse 15 to 16 in Luke chapter 5, but despite Jesus' instructions, the report of his power spread even faster and vast crowds came to hear him preach and to be healed of their diseases. And very importantly, it says, but Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness for prayer. Then in the next chapter, Luke 6, verse 12 to 13, it says, One day soon afterward, Jesus went up on a mountain to pray. He prayed to God all night. At daybreak, he called together all of his disciples and chose 12 of them to be apostles. Then you see in Mark chapter 1, 35 to 39, where it says, before daybreak, the next morning, Jesus got up and went out to an isolated place to pray. 
Later, Simon and the others went out to find him. And when they found him, they said, everyone is looking for you. But Jesus replied, we must go on to the other towns as well, and I will preach to them too. That is why I came. So he traveled through the region of Galilee, preaching in the synagogues and casting out demons. Now, the whole point why I read all of that is because we see we have time for ministry, but we also have time for that scheduled place where we meet God, just us and Him. We don't try to, you know, exclude our personal time with God just because we have ministry. It's good to do ministry, but you have to balance it. That's why it's called being consistent with prayer so that you can also be consistent with your ministry. And so when we have that balance where we can honor God through living in secret, because Jesus did these things in, you know, he did miracles in the public, right? He did lots of sermons on in public. But before he made decisions, before he knew what the ministry was that he had to do, he always set that time to go pray in secret. It reminds me of a song that I've listened to before, which goes like this. And I will wait, wait to hear your voice in the midst of this noise. You're all I want to hear, God. And I will wait as long as it takes for the silence to break. You're all I want to hear, God. You see, there are times when we, you know, listen to other people and we, you know, discuss with them, we relate with them. But there's that time where we just have that singleness in secret and we wait to hear God's voice. We don't want to hear anything else, but just simply God's voice. And that is what honors God when we give our best in secret. Now, obviously we refer to fasting, which is in uh, verse 16 onwards to verse 18. And obviously here, we're not trying to, you know, show off when we fast. We're not trying to make it obvious to everyone. Hey, look, I'm going to be fasting five days in a row or something like that. Obviously, that is a bit ambitious, but you have to stick to it, right? You can't, you know, these are the things that you should be doing in secret because you love God, right? You don't fast because you want to go on a diet, right? You don't fast because you want to, um, I don't know, brag about it. You know, you don't want to make it something that you can use to make yourself look better. The purpose of fasting has always been to get that special environment that is away from distractions. You give up things that you love doing usually to be able to focus on God whom you love more. Does that make sense? You give up things that you love on a daily basis to do things or to get closer to God whom, whom you love more than those things. And no one has to tell you to fast, right? It should be something that is naturally in your mind because as a Christian, we know that Jesus teaches about fasting and, and the importance of fasting, right? And we see that across all the scripture. And the idea is that we should notice this ourselves when we need to fast in secret. You should notice this as a, as a consequence of the fact that maybe you're not able to have enough time with God because of maybe work or because of uh, friends calling you out to go, you know, places and to do certain things. There has to be a time where you just say, no, today I'm going to be just dedicating it fully to God in secret because I need it. If I want to be on a spiritual level where I'm happy, then you can be very, you know, glad that you gave up that time. You sacrificed that, uh, the things that you would normally do to get closer to God whom you love more or you should love more. And I guess it's kind of like when you have expectations versus reality. Say, for example, you have a goal, right? You know, if you're not happy where you are when you're trying to reach a goal, you're obviously going to make some changes. You're going to make a, a few adjustments to make sure that you hit that goal. Otherwise, you know you're going to fail. And so fasting helps to remain on the right path spiritually with you and God in secret, of course. So ideally, this is what I want you guys to understand is that 
these things are done in secret because that's where God truly is honored. For example, as I said, and I don't want to drag out too long on this first point because this is mainly what I was going to say anyway, but the idea is that we just need to understand that being a Christian doesn't mean going to church or, you know, maybe putting a few Bible verses on your social media. It's what you do in secret. And that's what counts. That's what develops you as a person most of all. So, now that we have living in secret, a righteous life in secret as the first point, I want to move on to the second point, which says, we honor God when we prioritize our love for Him. And that verse, the verse that I want to refer to is in verse 24 from Matthew 6, where it says this, No one can serve two masters, for you will hate one and love the other, or be devoted to one and despise the other. And then it says, you cannot serve both God and money. Now, in this case, it says money, right? But think about it as an idol. Think about it as something that you maybe love so much or you're addicted to. You probably heard this verse many times and, you know, you probably taught about it in that way already in the sense that it's, an, it's referring to idols, things that are taking God's place. And so it says, just think to yourself, is there anything in your life that you love more than God. Now, when I say that, I'm obviously referring to the fact that what is occupying your time most? What's taking the most of your attention? What is on, you know, what is your heart always trying to do more of? Let me surprise you by saying that there may not just be two masters that you're serving. Possibly there are more masters from this world that you are serving. And all of these relate to the kingdom of... Uh, of course, in this case, I'm referring to masters that are considered sin or considered um, things that we should stay away from, especially if they become addicting and, and things that you can't really get away from. So let me surprise you in that sense that saying that there may be more than one let's say, evil master that you are serving. Of course, we want Jesus to be our master and that is what our goal should always be. But there's always the other masters in our lives that we give attention to and maybe too much, right? So, think about that for yourself. What is in my life taking most of my attention? What is considered more important than God in my life? And if you've already diagnosed that, if, if you've already found what they are, then you know what to do, right? You have to take action. You have to cut off whatever is, is taking you away from God's personal you know, relationship with, with you to make sure that you don't continue to dissociate or to fall even further away from the truth. So how do we approach this, you may ask? Well... There's a few examples that I want to give. In Matthew 22, verse 35 to 40, we have this. A lawyer asked Jesus, Teacher, which is the greatest commandment of the law? Jesus replied, You should love your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. He then added, This is the great and foremost commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend the whole law and the prophets. And this is the importance of prioritizing our love for God above everything else. Because this is the basic principle on which Christianity is revolving around. It's God's love for his people, for this, for this nation. And of course, that includes you too. And that's why we, as a response to God's love, must prioritize Him. And that's how we honor Him back. 
or that's how we honor him in, as a result of what he does for us. So love to God must be given our priority. We know Batania has this, um, let's say, I, I, I guess it's a motto or, or something like that, where it says, love God and love people, right? And that's, I believe, where the, that comes from. And the idea is that if we want to really understand how to love God properly, not just anyhow, we have to identify those idols, like I said. We must identify them so we can take them out of our heart. We can't serve or live our life for idols or masters, as, 20, uh, as verse 24 puts it. And then we just randomly say, oh yeah, I love God, but we don't actually we're kind of just saying it because we don't want to, you know, look bad. We don't want to look a bit strange. Maybe our friends are, are genuinely loving God and you feel like you're not there yet and you, you don't want to be left out. So I really hope that that is a motivation rather than a condemnation. But of course, if you're convicted that your love for God is not where it should be, then this is where you need to identify the idols that are taking your precious time away. Jeremiah 29 verse 13 says, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. You probably have heard that verse many, many times, but it doesn't lose its truth. Just because you hear it 10 times doesn't mean that it's not as true as it was the first time. So really keep that in mind. Recently in our devotional even, um, we read these verses from Genesis 35 verse 2 to 5. Chapter 20, 35, yep, verses 2 to 5, where it says, So Jacob told everyone in his household, Get rid of all your pagan idols, purify yourselves, and put on clean clothing. We are now going to Bethel, where I will build an altar to the God who answered my prayers when I was in distress. He has been with me wherever I have gone. So they gave Jacob all their pagan idols and earrings, and he buried them under the great tree near Shechem. And as they set out, a terror from God spread over the people in all the towns of that area. So no one attacked Jacob's family. So, just a great example of what we should be doing. Get rid of all your pagan idols, purify yourselves, and put on clean clothing. So what are the idols that you've been giving more attention to than God? I could give a full list of examples, but... Obviously, you know, we don't want to, it could go on and on and on because there are so many things that have come in this world in the last years when it comes to the addictions that you could have or the, the things that you could love more than God. Technology has been a driving force in that sense, right? You know, our phones could become our idols. Um, even the, the, the things that you are watching online could be the, the, the idols that you are, you know, having in your heart. Because instead of reading God's word, um, we're just kind of, you know, reading things that are not so useful. You know, God's word is our bread, right? And if we don't eat daily bread, it's kind of like, you know, just imagine if bread was the only food available, right? And you were not eating it. You were trying to find other food that was more, you know, that you thought was more um, satisfying, well, you've clearly missed the point, right? Because if bread is the, is the, the go-to, the, the ideal food that you should be aiming for to live, then that is exactly what we're trying to get to, is that God's word should be your daily bread. And I, I remember there was, um, I, I, I remember this quote when I read it many times, like many years ago, and it says something like, God's word should be your daily bread, not cake for a special occasion. Does that make sense? Like it shouldn't just be, you know, on your birthday once a year, oh, you have cake, that's great, you know, but it should be every single day, 365 days a year. So, like I said, we have to diagnose those idols, get them out of our lives so we can love God and prioritize our love for Him. Right, we've got the second point out of the way. And at the end, I'll remind you, okay, so you don't forget. Number three, we honor God 
when we prioritize His kingdom. You probably all have all heard the verse that is in verse 33, Matthew 6, where it says, and just to give some context, the previous verses link in together with this verse, but the principle remains. So it says, and he will give you all you need from day to day if you live for him and make the kingdom of God your primary concern. Now, primary concern is your priority, right? And the idea is that we need to understand that the kingdom of God should be and will always be a Christian's priority. Everyone who believes in the Lord Jesus Christ has been placed by God into his kingdom. This is from Colossians 1 verse 13. And so we know that, you know, the verses before this, verse 33, will talk about having enough food, having enough drink, having enough clothing every single day in order to live uh, a life that is uh, satisfied, let's say, from the, all the, the points of need. But Jesus says, don't worry about that. God will take care of it as long as you are primarily focused and you, you focus your attention on God's kingdom. Now, I want to make this very clear. Okay? There are many things that we need to give up in order to be a disciple. You probably heard Jesus talking about the cost of being a disciple, right? And he even says in Luke 9, verse 59 to 60, it says like this, Christ called the man to discipleship by saying, follow me. The man replied, Lord, permit me first to go and bury my father. The Lord then said something very important, which is allow the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim everywhere the kingdom of God. Jesus told them that the spiritually dead could bury the physically dead and that the spiritually alive should be busy proclaiming the kingdom of God. That means that even God's kingdom should be higher priority than the things of, you know, when it comes to your family, of course, family is important. But if God sends you on a mission, the cost is great, right? Jesus talks many times about loving God more than your, your father and your mother. And these are the costs of being a discipleship. Of course, God will call you to take care of your family. And that is naturally, you know, right. But there are also those specific occasions where God is telling you, look, I need you here. This is where you must go. And that is what we as Christians are, you know, signing up for as disciples. Even in the Our Father prayer, Jesus says, Our Father, your kingdom come. And so when he says your kingdom come, we're obviously referring to the fact that what's happening in heaven to happen here on earth. Your will be done. It continues. So what are the things that we should be doing to prioritize God's kingdom here on earth? We should ask ourselves, well, do the things that I do express the belief that Jesus is indeed the king in this kingdom? Are the things that I'm doing in my life expressing the fact that I trust in Jesus, the king, when he assigns me on a task, when he assigns me on a mission, on a ministry, that this is what God has entrusted for, for his plan in my life. So we obviously can get involved in many different things. And I want to give a few examples as to what we can get involved to set God's kingdom as our priority. For example, just as I mentioned, discipleship, right? We need to make disciples. That means to share the gospel, right? Invite them. Of course, we can't, you know, uh, meet in person for the church services, but you can still invite them to watch together with you this service, for example, right? Or the next one. And of course, there's other, you know, examples that I could give, for example, volunteering. There is a lot of uh, choices that you can have for volunteering. Um, obviously, this applies to both, to both boys and girls, 
because girls have specific gifts that they do best and boys have specific gifts, gifts that they do best as well. And we obviously have the case of the new church construction site, which is a perfect uh, opportunity for those that are available and that want to, you know, give a hand to, to the work that is happening in our new church construction site. And the idea is that the girls can also help in different ways. For example, there are, you know, places to help. <laughs> I don't want to give too many examples in that sense because I'm not a girl, so I can't really. But I want to make this very clear. I think you know yourself what examples there are. And um, I think I'll leave it at that because I don't want to get into dangerous territory. But um, it's okay. We'll leave it at that. So there's also mini mission trips, which of course we couldn't do this year or the previous year. But when things get back to, you know, better days, mission trips are also an example that you can use to gain, you know, experience with helping those that are abroad or even just in this in this country, right? There's um, care homes. There's all obviously... Um, people that are older that are in need of you know maybe grocery shopping or different things that uh, they can't do on their own then maybe there's just friends that you have that are maybe in in worse times or in difficult times and they need a hand they need someone to support them to to get out of that hole that they're in that is another example of you know working for the kingdom and that's what I want to get to I remember going to a camp, it was, uh, I think, 2019, and it was organized by Christ in Youth, and over there they had this, um, I guess it's like a, a title, where it says Kingdom Worker. And I don't know if, you know, you've heard this before, I don't know if you've seen this or, you know, on different platforms or social media of churches, but when I saw Kingdom Work, I was like, wow, like that's a great title to have, isn't it? You feel very included or important in God's ministry or God's plan for his people. So just in case you didn't know, if you are a person who has dedicated your life to Jesus, you are indeed a kingdom worker. All of us are kingdom workers. And so these are the many ways of being a kingdom worker voluntary work, sharing the gospel, discipleship, ministry, um, serving even just in general, um, whether it be, you know, through, uh, you know, the praise and worship teams, uh, the choir that we had in the past, um, evangelizing, uh, there was a team for that, the media team, of course, all of these components have that essence of serving people and serving God. Then, of course, when we understand the fact that we prioritize God by prioritizing his kingdom and honoring God by prioritizing his kingdom, as I was going to say, we need to understand that this all requires time. All of this requires time. At the end of the day, when we talk about priorities, it's where you allocate it. The time that you have is the same as any other person has. So you will always end up putting time into things that you enjoy or love. This, of course, is subjective. You decide what you love and you decide what you enjoy. So it's up to you to decide whether or not you will prioritize God through living a righteous life in secret, through um, volunteering or, you know, working as a kingdom worker or the second point, which is prioritizing God with our love for him. Now, I want to just have a, a, an ending to this, but a practical one, right? One that involves you to think about what I just said and to apply it into your life. So, Consider these things that I'm just going to list, for example. These things may be things that you're spending way too much time on that is not necessary. For example, one of the most obvious, right, is looking at a screen. 
I know you're currently watching through a screen and that's perfectly fine. But what happens for the rest of your day is what I'm trying to get to. The average person wastes between 15 and 40 hours a week watching programs that take up a lot of time. So <laughs> that is a lot, right? Think about it. Now, of course, you may, you know, had a day of work, you come home, you want to relax a bit and so on. But think about it this way. Technically, if you set a time for God where you pray and you just want to know God more, you want to hear his voice, that does give rest to your soul, to your even body, because you're mentally resetting, you're mentally emptying your mind from the day's work that you've had. And that's what I'm trying to get to, right? Is that, think about it this way, you could spend that time to rest, right? Whatever you consider is rest and to have peace by either using it on something that is not helpful or something that is helpful and gets you better results. So what would you rather choose, the television or sending time with God, right? Personally, I would go on a walk, maybe an hour or a bit, just because it would really freshen my mind. It would really reset my mind to know where am I, what do I need to do, and what things um, have I still, you know, got yet to do. Then, of course, sleeping, right? You may not need to sleep 10 hours or 11 hours or 12 hours, right? I know I like to sleep in sometimes um, just because I guess waking up early, you know, then coming home and stuff like that. But the idea is that maybe you don't need to sleep those extra hours. Maybe if you set that time, that extra hours that you would have, that you got to prepare, to um, read God's word, to do your devotional and things like that. It's simple things like that where you get good habits, right? So if you are getting nine hours or more, you could probably decrease a bit your sleep so that you can have more time for better things, for priorities that you should be focusing on. And of course, we have as well eating. <laughs> Maybe we snack too much. Maybe we, we, we take things, you know, we, we eat too much. I know that's a very strange one to say, but the idea that I'm trying to get to is fasting does indeed include getting rid of those times of eating, right? Because you want to set a time apart for God instead of focusing your mind on food. So just take, think about that, right? Think about that. Then I said, work, then I will add is your work. Some people devote much more time on the job than needed. Think about whether you work too much in the sense that you're always working overtime or that you're working exactly the right amount so that you can balance whether you have enough time at home, whether it be with your family or whether it be with your friends. But obviously all of this to be something that you can use for better priorities, for example. Um... Of course, you know, as, as people who use technology and so on, like I said before, what if you're spending too much time, I guess, trying to entertain yourself? So we use the TV, right? But obviously there's other things that, you know, are taking much of our time. As I said, you know, watching videos or programs or, you know, even playing games or going uh, like, you know, places so much that you just are never home and you're always somewhere or you may be just always distracted. And I think to myself sometimes, I need to, you know, get away from these distractions. So this is a practical challenge that I'm trying to make you to understand. Write down what you need to be doing to get back on track to have God as your number one priority in life. And that is when you will honor God. Try to keep in mind your priorities as you go through your day. Make choices in light of those priorities. You might want to sit down at a table, write out your priorities on a paper. And then when you see this in person, just written it down. It solidifies your commitment before God to use your time well. So 
make sure that you don't give in to, you know, oh, hey, we're going to go out today or, you know, if, if you have that day of fasting, use it properly and be sincere to God because that is what will honor you. It's about being focused on prioritizing God above the other things. So I want to finish off with this last quote, which says from Tozer, just like I said at the beginning, if God gives you a few more years, remember that it is not yours. Your time must honor God, your home must honor God, your activity must honor God, and everything you do must honor God. So remember, we honor God when we live or we prioritize living in secret, a righteous life in secret. We honor God when we prioritize our love for Him. And we honor God when we prioritize His kingdom. You are a kingdom worker. And as a result, that requires responsibility. So it is up to you, like I said, what you do with your time. It's up to you to decide what you consider important and what you love and enjoy the most. And I hope that now you take decisions that are much more important um, than the things that you would normally do, that you're so accustomed to. Get out of your comfort zone. Get out of the, the things that you're so comfortable with and see the changes that you, are, you know, that you are making that will result in greater things. Things that you can then be actually happy about and you can feel good about yourself in that sense because you made decisions that you are sticking to that you are committed to and consistent in. So that is the word that God has put in my heart. I want to finish up. Obviously, um, we have this program and, and this is the end of the program. But just remember, what happens afterwards, after this program, is not the end of this you know, journey with God. Set that time with God in, in your personal time, in your private time, in secret. So thank you for joining in. Thank you for um, l allocating this time to hear the word of God, to worship together with us. Because this, of, of course, is and should be one of your priorities, right? And that this is something that we should always um, think about when we honor God. I really hope that you continue to tune in to the, the next part of this series, which is honoring God and I think it will be the last part of this series. So make sure you do tune in and that you give attention to it and uh, stay strong. Remember, God's word is, your, is, is the bread that you should be eating every single day. And of course, until next time, we will always be even happier than we were today. May God bless you. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>